So before we open the Word of God, let us bow our heads for a word of prayer. O oh, Almighty and Everlasting and Wonderful Father, I just want to thank Thee for this uh, wonderful congregation that Thou hast uh, privileged me to be able to minister to. And Lord, I thank Thee for their giving and for their kindness and for their kind words and their prayers and their support. It's wonderful to have a church family that can stick together, press together, work together in these end times for Thy cause. And oh God, I just pray for each and every one of them this morning. Each and every family, each and every struggle, each and every difficulty, each and every trial and every woe, that thou wilt be with them and give them the strength that they need, O oh Lord, to continue walking in this path that thou hast set before us, the straight and narrow path to the kingdom. We pray, dear God, now that as we open thy holy word, thou wilt give us the grace to understand it, and to see what Thou hast shown us in Thy Word about how to live in preparation in these last days for Christ's soon coming. We pray, dear God, that Thy Word will go forth and will accomplish its purpose. And I pray, dear God, that Thou wilt make me a vessel today, that Thy Word will go forth, cleanse me of any unrighteousness and sinfulness and anything that is unlike Thee and anything that is impeding Thy Holy Spirit from having full sway with my heart, with my lips, with my mind. And let the words that I speak not be mine, but thine, O Lord. May they be clothed with thy Holy Spirit. May they penetrate hearts so that we can truly know how we ought to walk in these last days, so that we can be ready for heaven. We thank thee and praise thee for all these things, and we pray them in that magnificent and honorable and beautiful name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Amen. Rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer. We are definitely living in the last days of earth's history. Prophecies are fulfilling all around us. Jesus is coming again and he's coming very, very soon. Many want to know how soon, but the question is not how soon. The question for these times especially is how ought we to live in the face of Christ's imminent coming. God has given us His Son, Jesus Christ, His Word, and His blessed Holy Spirit as patterns of how we ought to live. And in His Word in Romans 12.12, 12, we have a beautiful, crucial pattern on how we ought to live always as Christians, and especially in these last days. When the Apostle Paul wrote the epistle to the Roman church, he wrote it with a burning heart for them to know what salvation is, what a connection with Christ is, and how that salvation, how that righteousness of Christ manifests itself into the everyday life. How it ought to be not only uh, received, but how it ought to be expressed in the life. And by the time we get to Romans chapter 12, uh, the apostle is telling us to offer or present our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is our reasonable service or worship, not to conform ourselves to this world, but be transformed, to use the gift that he has given us or the gifts that he has given us properly and, and humbly and, and rightly, to allow love to be without dissimulation or hypocrisy, to abhor that which is evil, to cleave that which is good, to be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love, in honor preferring one another, not to be slothful in business, especially the Lord's business, to be fervent in spirit and to serve the Lord. And then he gives us this beautiful little treasure or pattern in verse 12, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer. I want to look at that this morning and see what it means and how it translates into the Christian life as we are anticipating the coming of Jesus. The first one is rejoicing in hope. In the original Greek, hope comes first. It says in hope, rejoicing. That word hope means to anticipate, usually with pleasure, expectation, confidence, 
Faith, hope, hope. The Bible tells us that we're saved by hope. It calls the helmet of the armor of God in Ephesians the helmet of salvation, but in another place it calls it the helmet of hope. So hope and salvation are intricately intertwined. In another place it calls hope an anchor or a foundation or a basis for the Christian life. So what are we anticipating? What are we expecting? What are we hoping for above all else, according to the Word of God? In Romans chapter 8 and verse 23, Romans the 8th chapter and beginning in verse 23, the Word of God says there, Romans chapter 8 verse 23, talking about the whole creation groaning and travailing in pain together until now because when we sinned, we affected all of creation. And all of creation suffers now because of our sin. And it says that all of creation is groaning and travailing in pain. And verse 23 says, And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit. We who have been filled with the Holy Spirit, given the Holy Spirit as a first fruit of our saving relationship with Christ. Even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for what? The adoption, to wit, the redemption of our body. We're waiting for the adoption, to wit, the redemption of our body. We're waiting for the first resurrection. We're waiting for the second coming of Jesus Christ. We're groaning and waiting for that beautiful day when this mortal shall put on immortality and this corruption shall put on incorruption. This is our hope the hope of the soon return of Christ. And he says it in the very next verse, for we are saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope, for what a man seeth, what doth he yet hope for? But if we hope for that we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. In another place, the Apostle Paul says, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. We are living in hope and we are saved by hope. How are we saved by hope? The Bible says in 1 John that he that hath this hope in him purifieth himself as he is pure. This hope, it's a particular hope. It's the hope of the soon coming of Christ in the context of 1 John and in the context of the Bible. And that hope causes us now to seek the purification that can come from Christ alone, from his righteousness And as he purifies us, we enter into that saving relationship where we can be ready for Christ to come. We change the pattern of our lives. We change the way we live. We change our minds and our hearts and our characters. We become a converted people, a convicted people. But let me ask you, how is your hope for the soon coming of Jesus? Have you allowed something to come in and fizzle it out? Have you allowed the cares of this world, the stresses of this world, the toils of this world, the turmoil of this world, the turmoil of your life, of your problems, of your difficulties, have you allowed that to crowd out the blessed hope to where that's no longer in the front line anymore, but you're hoping for something else? Or you've lost hope completely? Look at Abraham in Romans chapter 4 as a beautiful example. Romans chapter 4 and verse 18. Look what it says of him. He says in verse 18, God had told him he'd be the father of many nations in verse 17. And then it says, who against hope believed in hope. I love that phrase. Against hope, he believed in hope. In other words, against everything that he saw, against everything that he saw as reality, his age, his ability, his character, against all the things that he saw in himself, he still had hope. Why? Because he placed his hope and his trust in Almighty God, not in himself. And even though he may have done some things that would be considered faithless for a moment, he got back to that anchor of hope and he was able to go forward. And even though sometimes your hope is obscured, you need to to believe 
in that hope of the blessed and soon return of Jesus, even if it looks like it's against hope, even if it looks like it's not going to happen, even if, it, if the world is telling you something that is not true. And it says, why did he believe in hope? That he might become the father of many nations? According to that which was spoken, so shall thy seed be. And being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead when he was about a hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God. Being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was also able to perform. The hope was in God's ability, not his ability. And God's ability is endless. God's ability is stronger than any strength. God's ability goes beyond anything else. He is the God of the impossible. So we can trust him. Has he not been there for you before? Has he not given you healing and grace and strength before? Has he not given you victory over sin before? Has he not given you joy through pain before? Has he not made you strong before? He can do it again. That's why he imputed, his faith was imputed unto him for righteousness. Why? Because his faith allowed him to do righteousness. He obeyed God because he believed God. Today, if we're obeying God, but we don't trust Him, we're not really obeying Him. That's why the Apostle says at the end of Romans, whatsoever is not a faith is sin. In order to truly obey Him, we must believe Him. And then His righteousness comes upon us, and then we do things out of the right motive. Because we love God, and we trust Him, and we believe in Him. Now we come to Romans 5, verse 1. It says, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand, and rejoice in what? In hope of the glory of God. We rejoice now in hope of God's glory because we know His glory is in us, and we know His glory is coming soon, and we know His kingdom is going to abide forever, and all other kingdoms will fall. And not only so, verse 3, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience, and experience hope. Experience brings or works hope. Experience with what? Experience with the things of God. Today we're experiencing a lot of things, but unfortunately the things that we experience on a day-to-day -day basis are not leading us closer to God, but further away from Him. We're experiencing trust and hope in our emotions. We're experiencing trust and hope in our lusts. We're experiencing trust and hopes in our materialism. But we need to begin to experience the things of God, the things in His Word, the things of His work, the things of His mind, so that this experience now will work hope. Because if we don't spend time with God, our hope will be lost. And if our hope is lost, our faith is lost. And if our faith is lost, our salvation is lost. Because we no longer hope for His coming. We no longer eagerly, with eager anticipation. To anticipate, that word hope, as I said before, means to anticipate with pleasure. And I'm wondering in myself today, if we're anticipating the second coming of Christ with pleasure. Or is it an interruption in what's going on in our lives today? Verse 5 says, And hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. So when we have that hope, that blessed hope, we're not ashamed. We will not be ashamed before God. Why? Because we're not going to be sinning against God. We're not going to be shaming God with our behavior and our conversation and our actions. That hope will not make us ashamed. And it will not make us ashamed of Christ because we know He's coming. And so we're not afraid to tell people about it. Even in this world of sin and of unrighteousness, we are not afraid of telling people about Jesus. Even though today people are saying, don't talk about Christ. Don't talk about His converting power. Don't talk about His righteousness. Don't talk about His divinity. Don't talk about all these things. We don't care. We continue to share these things with the world because we have this hope. And as the hymn says, it burns within our hearts. It's not a hope that's just there 
to be fondled with and considered philosophically. It's a living hope. In fact, in Peter, it's called a lively hope. It's not just any other hope. It's not a faint hope. It's a living hope. How do we find and strengthen this godly hope? Romans chapter 15 tells us how. In Romans chapter 15, beginning in verse 4. Verse 4, and we also want to look at verse 13. Notice what it says. In chapter 15, verse 4, For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for what? Our learning. Why? Why do we need to learn these things? So that we can show off our Bible knowledge? No. That we, through patience and comfort of the Scriptures, might have hope. See? Whenever we read the Bible, it's not just to parade our learning or to tell people how many verses we've memorized, or to show people how much we know about the Bible in a trivial sense. It's to birth hope in us. A hope, a lively hope, a living hope, a fiery hope of Christ's soon coming and our preparation for it. Because every time you read the Bible, it should bring you hope. Even when you read those things that disturb you, especially when you read those things that disturb you, especially when you read about the sins of Israel, and the unrighteousness of the people, and, and all these people that were committing sin, it should give you hope to say, well, God wrote these things down for me, that when I read them, I, I don't want to live like that. Because I'm waiting for Christ to come. I don't want to be in that lifestyle anymore. And then in verse 13, it says, Now the God of hope, He's the God of love, or He's love. God is love, but He's also the God of hope. Fill you with what? With all joy and peace in believing that ye may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. Ah, so when you read the Word and you truly see it, the Holy Spirit now comes alongside and gives you hope and causes that hope to abound, to multiply, to grow, to become more and more fiery. And it gives you joy and peace in believing. You can't find joy and peace in anything else but in believing in believing in God, in trusting in God, in walking with God, in following God. And, and the verse in Romans 12, 12 says, in hope, rejoicing. That word means an inner joy that no man can take from you. A joy that is solid. But it must be joy in the blessed hope, not in the world. And I want to show you how Paul phrases it in another place. He says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 19, 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 19, notice what he says there, talking about the resurrection, talking about the state of the dead, that they are sleeping now and they're waiting for the resurrection. And he says, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are what? Of all men most miserable. And that describes, in a very interesting way, the majority of Christians today. They only have hope in Christ in this world. Oh, if Jesus will only help me to pay my bills. If Jesus will only help my right hook so I can knock the guy out. If Jesus will only help my singing so I can become famous. If Jesus will only help me in the things that I want in this world. If Jesus will only help me now so that I can continue to live my life on my terms. What does it say in the verse? We are of all men most miserable. And you notice a lot of Christians are miserable today, so-called Christians, because that's all they want from God. They want Him to help them in this world, in this life, in the things that they're doing right now, to help them live their lives according to their own rules, according to their own terms, according to their own ways. And God says you're going to have misery that way. That's never going to bring you any joy. The only joy we've got is to look up and say, Jesus is coming. I want to be ready. And I'm looking forward to it. And yes, God help me to pay my bills and work hard. Not my right hook, because you shouldn't be doing that to people. God help me with all the things that I need to do according to His law and according to His will and according to His word. But most of all, God help me to be ready for His soon coming. Because you notice, what do most people hope for in this world? 
I hope I get better. I hope I feel better. I hope I have more money. I hope I can buy a house. I hope this, I hope that. That's not the blessed hope. And so many people now in the church have allowed the world into the church and they're saying, let's go out there and change the world. This world is not going to change, sorry. This world's getting worse and worse. It's waxing old like a garment, the Bible says. This world is on its way to perdition. We're not here to change the world or make the world a better place. We're here to change people and prepare them for another world. The one that is coming. That's the one we ought to be preparing for. Not putting all our, our, our hopes and our energies in this world. Sure, go out there and feed people. Go out there and help people out. Go out there and do nice things for people. But don't think that by doing that, you're going to necessarily be ready for Jesus to come. Because in order for us to be ready for Jesus to come, he, we have to allow him to do a thorough work in our character. We have to break our hard hearts. We have to die to self. We have to begin reflecting his righteousness. Or else nothing's going to change. Jesus said to the apostles, to the disciples in Luke chapter 10, verse 20, after he had sent them out in Luke 10, 20. And they came back after he had sent the 70 out. And they came back and they said in verse 17 of Luke 10, the 70 returned again with joy saying, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us through thy name. And he said unto them, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. I was there when he fell. Behold, I give you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. You will have that power to go forward, and, and you will be immortal till your work is done. However, verse 20, notwithstanding, in this rejoice not that the spirits are subject unto you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. Amen. That's the joy. That's where the joy is. Don't rejoice in the power because that's what many people are doing in Christianity today. They're rejoicing in the power. They're rejoicing in the gift. <coughs> They're rejoicing in the ability. They're rejoicing in all these things. And that type of joy brings pride because I've got more of it than you do or I can sing better than you do, or I can do this better than you do. And that brings pride. That's not where our joy ought to be. Our joy should be the fact that if we have come to Christ, and if we have made things right with Him, and if we are walking in Him and He in us, the name is in heaven. That's the joy that I want to have. Don't you? Where is your joy today? Where is it? Is it in the things of this world? What makes you happy? You have to think about that. Are you most happy when you have your Bible open and you're reading the Word of God and praying? Or has something else taken the place of that happiness? Because many people are happy with a lot of things nowadays, but they're not happy just being with God. That's the problem. That's the problem in society. That's the problem in our world today. We've given ourselves over to Satan, and as a result, Satan shows us what kind of world he's going to make. Halloween is now the, probably the best-selling holiday, so-called, in the year. People are making millions out of this satanic holiday, so-called. And some Christians are even celebrating Halloween. They're coming to church and saying, I give glory to God, and they're going home and worshiping the devil. What are you doing? And then we say, oh, we love God. No, you don't. If something else makes you happier, something especially that God has said no to, something that represents an enemy to God, and you go and rejoice over that kind of stuff, and you say there's no harm in it, <laughs> whenever you reach that stage, you're not living in the spiritual realm anymore. You're living in the worldly one. And you need to repent. And you can substitute that with anything that takes the place of your joy in Christ and in being with Christ. That's why he says, 
rejoicing in hope, in hope rejoicing, not in the things of the world. He that hath this hope purifieth himself as he is pure. He that hath this hope spends time with Christ. He that has this hope receives his righteousness. Our hope must be a joyful hope, not a fearful hope, not a stressed out hope, not an angry hope, not a man-made or man-centered hope. It ought to be a joyful hope. But you know, every time we hear about the second coming of Jesus, we see the rolling of the eyes and the crossing of the arms. And, oh, they've been saying that for years now. Who cares? I'm still waiting. I want him to come. You notice a child, whenever you're taking a long trip in a car and the child is asking you every five minutes, are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? And the child doesn't get to the point where he says, oh, I've asked it a million times already. He wants to get there. I want to get there. I don't care how often I have to say he's coming soon. I'm not going to get tired of that. Oh, stop saying that. You know, we've been saying that for a thousand years. What are you, a thousand years old now? I want him to come. And I'm going to keep anticipating. And I'm anticipating it with pleasure. You know, like when you give somebody a gift and it's all wrapped up, and you know that person loves you and they're giving you something that you love and you can't wait to open that gift. You're earnestly anticipating opening that gift. Well, that's the kind of earnest anticipation we ought to have for Christ's coming and the preparation for it. That ought to be our preparation. And notice that, you know, for many of us, it's a fearful hope. Why is it a fearful hope? Because we're not ready. Truth were to be told, we're not ready for him to come. And we know we're not ready for him to come. And so whenever somebody tells us he's coming, it gets us trembling and afraid because we're not ready. Well, get ready. Get ready. What are you waiting for? Nobody has to tell you to get ready to go somewhere where you want to go, do they? Do they? Nobody's got to tell you. You're ready, you're at the door. One hour before it's time to leave, you're ready to go. What's the matter with us? Are we not waiting for him to come anymore? For many people, the blessed hope has become a stressed out hope. Busy looking at events that are going on in the world. And oh, what's the Pope doing now? Who cares? What's Christ doing now? What's Jesus doing now? What does he want to do with his church, with his people? He wants to pour out his spirit. He wants a holy people, a righteous people, a witnessing people, a people that are on fire for God so they can go out there and tell the world about Christ. That's what he wants. Now everybody's afraid all the time. Oh, did you hear what happened here? Oh, did you hear what's happening with the LGBTQ community? Oh, did you hear what's happening with these people? Oh, they're persecuting Christians. Of course they're going to persecute. What do you think? What do you think? Do you think that we're friends with the world? Maybe you do. Maybe you've become a friend of the world. Maybe that's why it takes you by surprise when people actually come out and say that they hate Christians and that they would persecute them. Maybe that's why. Maybe we've become a little too friendly with the world. So when we actually see reality happening in front of us, we get all surprised and then we get scared and then we say, what are we going to do? What are you talking about? As soon as you stepped in front online to baptize, to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ and to follow him, you took up your cross and followed him. That's what he says. And what is... Let me ask you, when someone takes up his cross, what's he going to do? Party with the cross? What's he going to do with that cross? He's going to crucify himself on it. The cross is for crucifixion. Did you know that? It doesn't just mean we carry it around like a trophy and laugh and, and, and have a good old-fashioned time with the cross. When you take up that cross to follow Christ, you're headed for death, death to self, and alive unto Jesus Christ. I'm not telling you, you want to look at events and, and, and see fulfilled prophecy, go ahead. I have no problem with that. What I'm saying is the way we react to these things, we need to examine ourselves in the way we react because the way we react show us where our heart is. See? Because if this is a surprise to you, then, then you haven't been in contact with God for a while. 
Because it says, all that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. And you're not going to find that in the King James Version promise book. But it's a promise. So, if we're not living godly in Christ Jesus, of course we're going to get shocked when people start hating us. Oh, what a surprise. They've hated us since the beginning. That's what Jesus said, didn't he? So what ought we to do about it? We ought to have a joyful hope. Through this mess, through this morass of unrighteousness, through this, 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 this atmosphere, this miasma, this, this polluted, sinful world, we ought to have a joyful hope. Jesus said it beautifully in John chapter 15, verse 11. Listen to what he said. He said in chapter 15, verse 11, These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. Did you catch that? My joy, your joy. My joy becomes your joy. My joy fulfills your joy. I've spoken these things to you. What was he speaking about? <coughs> he was speaking about being the true vine. And as long as we abide in him, then his joy remains in us and our joy becomes full. My joy and your joy. In Psalm 43, in verse 5, David picks up the talk about hope. And he says in Psalm 43, 5, Why art thou cast down, O my soul? Why art thou disquieted within me? Hope in what? In God. For I shall yet praise him who is the health of my countenance and my God. So yes, David was saying, look, even though I'm, I'm, I'm suffering and, and I'm downtrodden and I, I feel depressed and I feel saddened and I feel all these things with the things that are happening around me, people betraying me, people uh, going after me, people seeking my life to kill me. Why are you cast down? Hoping God, I will yet praise him even through the storm. I will praise him. And I won't let anyone take away my joy in the blessed hope. They can take away anything else, but they can't take away my joy. And Jesus Christ is the beautiful example of this. It says of him in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. He is our joy. He is our hope. It was a joy for him to go to the cross. Why? Not because he was looking forward to getting beaten and crucified and separated from his father. Because he was looking forward to the people who were going to come to salvation through that sacrifice, through his blood. And it was a joy for him. So should we have that same eye to God, to his coming, that no matter what happens in this world, no matter what we see, no matter what we experience, we will wait with earnest anticipation and expectation and confidence and faith and hope because Jesus is coming soon. Amen. And every day we'll do our best to prepare ourselves. You know, we don't spend enough time preparing ourselves every day for the second coming of Christ. We can't even prepare for the Sabbath anymore properly. You notice that? Things have become so busy. We have no time for anything and the devil's laughing at us and he's happy because he says, these people, I've got them, they're mine. Because they're so busy, they're not spending time with God. He knows, he knows the reality that if you don't spend time with God, you're finished. He's got you, he knows that. He sees you busy in and out every day of the week and you lose that blessed hope and then somebody has to stir you up by telling you something that the Pope's going to do or something that's happening in society and all of a sudden you get all scared about it and you get excited about it and you say, oh, i got to pray more and i got to go to church more and, I, and it lasts for two weeks and then you're back to the grind again. What kind of Christianity is that? But when hope becomes the anchor, every day I'm preparing. Whether the world is nice or whether the world is brutal or whatever happens out there, I'm getting ready. Because I've got other plans. My plans are not in this earth. My plans are for heaven. I want to prepare my character for heaven. 
Then he says, patient in tribulation. In the original again, it says, in tribulation, enduring. To endure means to remain faithful and obedient. That word tribulation in the Greek means pressure, anguish, trouble. Do you have pressure in your life? Do you experience trouble in your life? Do you sometimes experience anguish in your life? It says to be patient in tribulation. That is, to endure, to make sure that you're faithful. And what kind of faithfulness is it talking about? Revelation chapter 12, verse 17. Revelation 12, 17, what does it say there? And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed. Who is he making war with? Us. This is a war zone. You know that, right? People think they come into the remnant church and everything is going to be hunky-dory and rosy. Uh-uh. There's a war going on. It's a serious war. Which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. And then in 14.12, it says, Here is the patience of the saints. Here is the patience. And that word for patience, the same one, patient in tribulation. Here is their patience. Here is their endurance. In what is the endurance found? Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. In obedience and in faith and trust to God. That's where our endurance is found. That's where our patience is found. That's how we can go through tribulation. One commentator puts it this way. What is it to be patient? Not to murmur against God. Do you murmur against God? Then you're not patient. Not to despair of deliverance. Not to ever say, He'll never deliver me. I've lost my hope. Not to use unlawful means to get out of tribulation. That means to sin so that the pressure can go away. Never. That's not being patient. To rest satisfied with tribulation. To be satisfied with problems. That's not being patient under them. To be patient is to be thankful for them and to endure. To be faithful. To say, Lord, what can I learn from this problem about my character? What needs to change in my character? How can I be a better person in Christ? How can I be more prepared for the soon coming of Jesus? That's what Jesus wants to see. Jesus said in Matthew 13, 20 and 21, he talks about the stony ground hearers. Notice what he says there. It's very interesting. Matthew chapter 13. And beginning in verse 20, talks about the different types of soil of the heart for the sower who goats out to sow. And he says in verse 20, He that received the seed into stony places, the same is he that heareth the word, and anon with joy receiveth it. So far, so good. He hears the word and says, Oh, that's good. I like that. But notice the next one. Yet hath he not root in himself, that root is Christ. He dureth for a while, he endures for a while. But when tribulations or persecution ariseth because of the word, by and by he is offended, he's scandalized. He becomes embarrassed and he leaves God. Did you catch that? So yeah, you can come and say, oh, that was great, I love that, that was a wonderful sermon. But if it doesn't do something to you to go home and get your heart ready for the soon coming of Jesus, it's useless, isn't it? Useless. You go away from here and you continue just like you were before, we've all wasted our time. Right? Come here for nothing. Christ's Object Lessons says this about the stony heart. It says, He who hath not root in himself dureth for a while. Many receive the gospel as a way of escape from suffering rather than as a deliverance from sin. Did you catch that? They receive the gospel to escape from suffering, to get better, because people keep telling them, Oh, it's going to get better. You come to Christ and everything is going to be just great. Rather than as a deliverance from sin. 
They rejoice for a season, for they think that religion will free them from difficulty and trial. While life moves smoothly with them, they may appear to be consistent Christians, but they faint beneath the fiery test of temptation. They cannot bear reproach for Christ's sake. When the Word of God points out some cherished sin or requires self-denial or sacrifice, they are offended. It would cost them too much effort to make a radical change in their life. They look at the present inconvenience and trial and forget the eternal realities. Yeah. We're all busy. You know what? We're all busy. Everybody's busy. You're not the only one that's busy. But if you don't give some time to God's work, don't call yourself a Christian. You know what I mean? We're all busy. So when that busyness comes, and you're the stony ground here, and you've only come to church to receive but not to give, then one day when it becomes too hard and you're receiving nothing but persecution and scorn and trial, well then you're going to leave. You're going to be shaken out. Right? That's what happens. If we can't even sacrifice one hour a week to come to prayer meeting. Don't come and tell me you're a Christian. You don't have one hour a week to come to prayer meeting? You don't have one hour a week to do something for God's cause? You don't have one hour a week, I'm talking about, a week. How many hours do you spend working? How many hours do you spend enjoying yourself? How many hours do you spend in recreation? And how many hours do you spend doing God's work? How many? I'm too busy. God will understand. It's not that important. Oh, yes, it is. He won't understand because it's his cause. Do you understand what I'm telling you or no? One hour a week to call somebody and pray with them? Come on. A week. We don't even spend that much time. And then we come to church and we say, I've had a rough week, pastor. You better give me some encouragement because if you don't, I'm going to complain. <laughs> Who cares? You know what? Go ahead and complain. You have a problem with the messages. The problem is not with me. It's with you. Because all week... You're burning yourself out in materialism. You're burning yourself out working. You're burning yourself out enjoying yourself. And then once a week you want to come to church and somebody to tell you it's all going to be okay, pat you on the shoulder and say, we're all headed to heaven, brother. No, we're not. Not if we keep living like that, we're not. You understand what I'm telling you? Or no? Hmm. That's the problem. The Christian life has to spill over into everything. It has to affect everything. Or else it affects nothing. It's just a concept. It's a membership. It's a philosophy. It's an opinion. And it's out the window after we're done. And if, you have to, if people have to chase after you to do God's work, come on. People have to chase after you? Jesus said in John 16, in the world you will have tribulation. So it's a given. But in me, you have peace. Isn't that wonderful? So if we're so busy with tribulation, and then we want somebody else to give us some comfort, we've got the wrong philosophy in our heads. Peace is found in Christ, so you have to go to Him. You have to spend time with Him. You have to draw closer to Him. In Acts 14.22 it says, We must through much tribulation enter into the kingdom of God. Ah, they don't talk about that when they tell you about salvation. Much tribulation, that means much pressure, much anguish, much trouble. We must enter into the kingdom of God. Where does the anguish and pressure and trouble come from? It doesn't just come from the devil and the world. It comes from within too. Because we've got to be troubled with our condition. We've got to be stirred up. We've got to be disturbed about our condition. And we've got to take our condition to God and say, Lord, I'm a sinful man. Help me. I'm overwhelmed with my sins. Help me. I'm, I'm helpless. 
Give me victory, Lord. And God says, spend more time. Submit yourselves unto God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. You notice? It doesn't just say resist the devil. It says submit to God and then resist the devil and then he will flee from you. If you don't submit to God, you have no power to resist anything. In Romans 5, 3, it says glory in tribulations because tribulation worketh patience. So the very thing that you hate is actually giving you endurance because it's showing you yourself. When trouble comes, how do you react to it? You want a pat on the back and a parade? You notice now on, on these uh, media, social media sites, everybody plasters their problems for everybody to see because they want people to say, oh, poor thing, oh, I love you, oh, isn't that great? That's pride. That's pride. And nobody today wants anybody to tell anybody, you're doing wrong, you better do right. Don't judge me. Who are you to judge me? It's not judgment. It's edification. Edification. <laughs> We're here to build each other up. How do you build each other up? By building up ego? By telling everybody how wonderful they are so that the crash can be bigger when they fall? No. You build each other up by saying, brother, I'm praying for you. We need to go the right way. We need to do the right being an example for Christ. That's how we build each other up. In Romans 8.35, it says, Shall tribulation separate us from Christ? No, nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. And in Revelation 7.14, we have a big group of people that comes out of great tribulation because they wash their robes in the blood of the Lamb. That's where it's at. John Wycliffe, the great reformer, wrote this about the connection between prayer and tribulation. He says this, Whoso prayeth devoutly shall have help oft to pray, and profits much to establish the heart in God, and suffers it not to bow about, now into this and now into that. The fiend is overcome by busy and devout prayer, and becomes as feeble and without strength to them that are strong and persevering in devout prayers. Devout prayer of a holy soul is a sweet incense which driveth away all evil savors and enters up by odor of sweetness into the presence of God. Busy in prayer, because busy in anything else, and the devil gets stronger, and he's got a firmer hold on you. But busy in prayer, and the fiend becomes weaker. Devout prayer. Spending time with God. And the final injunction of the pattern in Romans 12, 12 is continuing instant in prayer. That word instant also can mean, according to Vincent's studies, urgent. Urgent prayer. Because we truly need him. That word instant also means to persist, to continue steadfastly, to persevere, to wait. The old Christians, they used to get on their knees and they used to wait till they had peace with God. They had to wrestle it out. Sometimes it took hours. The problem is not with God. He's ready to give it instantaneously. The problem's with us. We've got to work through that, that fallow ground, that hard ground in our hearts. So it takes hours to work and to wrestle with God. But they would do it until they had peace. Then they'd get up from off their knees and said, it shall be well. Whatever happens now, I can face it. God is here with me. I know it now. But it took time. Today we don't take time. Today we talk to God and we tell Him what to do. <laughs> Bless my day. Your day? This is the day that the Lord hath made. We must persist in prayer because we easily become faint in prayer. Don't we? How often do we give up too fast on our knees? We don't spend enough time. And then we get up and we say, oh, he hasn't answered. Oh, I still feel like, what, like how I felt before. Oh, I'm still scared. Oh, I still feel nervous. Well, of course not. Of course you're going to feel that way. You've given up. You've fainted. Jesus said the characteristic of those who don't faint. He gave that parable of the woman who came to the judge, the unjust judge. And she kept bothering him with her case in Luke 18. And then he gives, you, he gives you the characteristic of those 
who are like her spiritually. In verse 7, it says, Shall not God avenge his own elect, his chosen, which are what? How are his chosen identified here? Which cry day and night unto him, though he bear long with them. They cry day and night unto him. They don't just, they don't just go there and say their prayers, all nice and formal-like and then rise up from their knees the same way they got down there? They change. There's something different about them. Felix Neff gives the illustration of a pump, a water pump. When a pump is frequently used, but little pains are necessary to have water. The water pours out at the first stroke because it is high. But if the pump has not been used for a long while, the water gets low, and when you want it, you must pump a long while, and the water comes only after great efforts. So it is with prayer. If we are instant in prayer, every little circumstance awakens the disposition to pray. And desires and words are always ready. But if we neglect prayer, it is difficult for us to pray, for the water in the well gets low. Don't you find that that happens to you? It gets low, so we can't pray. And then we blame God. We say, oh, he's not hearing me. He's not answering me. He's right there waiting. But your heart and mine has to get right with him. And this is so important. The pump needs to be pumped constantly so that we can have that time with God. People go to seminars on prayer, 12 steps to praying properly, and all they do is become 12-step prayers. They get down there with their list and they say, oh, i got to thank him first. Of course you got to thank him. Don't you feel grateful for everything he's done for you? What kind of nonsense is that? <laughs> no common sense in religious things. No common sense at all. And so we go to these seminars and we get these 500 steps to proper praying and we, we go through the list and then we're no better than we were before and then we drop the list. And then another seminar comes along with a different list and we say, oh, this list might work, but it doesn't. Then another list comes around, that one doesn't work, and then we give up prayer altogether. Do you want to learn to pray? There's one secret. You want to know what the secret is? Pray. That's it. You want to learn to pray more? Pray more. That's it. There's nothing else. How do you make relationships with people? How do you get closer to people? You spend more time with them, don't you? You don't have a list with your friends going, okay, what are we going to talk about first tonight that we get together to have a good time? Let's see now. Oh, yeah, let's, let, me talk about, let me tell you about my week. Do you do that when you get together with your friends? <laughs> if you do, you have a problem. I would not want to be in your company at that point. We persevere in prayer. We must persevere in prayer because we often give up in prayer. You know, uh, Elijah, when he was praying for rain to come, it's a very interesting thing. In 1 Kings chapter 18, you don't mind if I'm keeping you a little later, do you? You don't have any place to go. You're not busy today. You have things to do. 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 43. Notice what it says here. And he said to his servant, Go up now, look toward the sea. And he went up and looked and said, there's nothing. And he said, go again seven times. And it came to pass at the seventh time that he said, behold, there ariseth a little cloud out of the sea like a man's hand. And he said, go up, say unto Ahab, prepare thy chariot and get thee down, that the rain stop thee not. Now, did you catch that? And the Spirit of Prophecy says something interesting about that. Review in Herald, May 26, 1891. She says, the servant watched while Elijah prayed, Six times he returned from the watch, saying, There is nothing, no cloud, no sign of rain. But the prophet did not give up in discouragement. He kept reviewing his life to see where he had failed to honor God. See, he wasn't looking and saying, What, no rain? i got to pray harder now. i got to ask for rain harder. No. i got to go through the list. Did I praise him? Did I? No. None of that. He kept reviewing his life to see where he had failed to honor God. He confessed his sins and thus continued to afflict his soul before God while watching for a token that his prayer was answered. As he searched his heart, he seemed to be less and less 
both in his own estimation and in the sight of God. It seemed to him that he was nothing and that God was everything. And when he reached the point of renouncing self while he clung to the Savior as his only strength and righteousness, the answer came. You see it now? Hmm? That's what it's got to be. Because the more time you spend on your knees, the more you recognize the greatness and the grandeur of God and the more you see yourself as smaller. And then you cling because you see yourself that way. You cling to his righteousness and you say, that's all I've got. And then the answers come. That's perseverance in prayer. We must wait in prayer because we often become impatient in waiting. Didn't David say it? Psalm 27. Almost done. 13 and 14. I had fainted, I would have fainted, unless I had believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Now, did you notice he, had, he, said, he didn't say, unless I had seen the goodness of the Lord. I would have fainted unless I believed that I was going to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Faith. And then he says, wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Perseverance. Put everything else aside. And spend time in prayer. And pray to God earnestly. And ask Him to give you those beautiful, holy emotions so that you can feel uh, the, the, your need of Him. You can feel the, 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 the terribleness of sin in your own heart first and then in the world and in the church. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 7. But the end of all things is at hand. Be ye therefore sober, and watch unto prayer. Doesn't say anything else. It says, be sober, serious, awake, watchful, and watch unto prayer. Nicholas Burton, one of the martyrs, was on his way to the stake. And in the flames, he was so patient and cheerful that the tormentor said, the devil has his soul before he came to the fire, and therefore his senses of feeling were past. He was so patient and cheerful in the flame that people actually were saying that the devil took his soul before that, so he had no senses of feeling. Ridiculous accusation. But notice the man was that patient and fearful in the flames. They say of John Bradford, as he was dying in the flames, he was like a fresh gale on a hot summer day. He was praising God. How was he able to do that? He lived like that. He lived like that. Everywhere he went, people saw Christ in him. Nazianzen said of his sister Gorgonia that she was so given to prayer that her knees seemed to grow to the very ground. Of Trasilla, it is reported that being dead, she was found to have her elbows as hard as horn by leaning to a desk at which she used to pray. James is said to have had knees as hard as camel's knees by his continual kneeling in prayer. Paul the Aramite was found dead, kneeling upon his knees, holding up his hands, lifting up his eyes, so that the very dead corpse seemed yet to live and to pray to God. Now they didn't do that so they could show people their calluses and their elbows and their knees. They did that because they loved God so much that they were just lost in His presence. And beloved, I give you these examples not so you can go and beat yourself and berate yourself over the head with the fact that we're so far from them, but to challenge you to start living that life that God has given us to live because if we don't, nothing else is going to matter when Christ comes. When you have to face Him, nothing else is going to matter. The little overtime you had to do is not going to matter. That one thing you never bought is not going to matter. All those little things that you were worried about are not going to matter when Christ comes. So you got to make up your mind that either you're going to be ready for it or just give it up altogether. But don't play around with it. Don't play around with it. Make up your mind that I'm going to follow him. And that means when I leave this church, it's not just business as usual. It's not just nice sermon pastor and have a nice day and, and things go on like they went on before. But it's I'm going to do something about it with God's help. I'm going to do something about it. I'm not just going to sit there and just say, oh, yeah, whatever. 
That's great. But I'm going to do something about it. Because unless we do, beloved, nothing's going to change. And it's going to get worse and worse. And when tribulation comes, we're not going to be ready for it. And we're going to die without hope. And I don't want that to happen to any one of you or to myself. So I plead with you today in the name of Jesus, change it. You know what you need to change. You know what you need to do. It's your life. You're living it. You know it. Start doing it. Don't get all philosophical. Oh, I can't do it. Do it. You do it for other things, do it for this. Isn't this the most important thing in the world? Jesus Christ's second coming? Isn't that the most important thing in the world? And are you going to miss out on that? For the little sins, for the little lusts, for the little materialism, for the little money, for the little overtime? You're going to miss heaven for that? And so I beseech you, I beg of you, make a change. As I'd say to myself, make a change. And say, Lord, here I am. Mold me and reshape me and make me new. Because I want to be ready for Jesus to come. If you want to say that, I want to ask you to get on your knees with me and let's seek his power and his grace. Oh Lord, I <clears throat> come to thee first of all from myself, asking thee to forgive me, Lord, where I have been deficient in these things in my own life. And I beseech thee, Lord, that thou would give me the desire the urgency to be able to live this way each and every day. And, oh God, I come on behalf of my dear brothers and sisters in Christ, for they have knelt before Thee also, because we see ourselves, Lord, we see the, the tyranny of busyness taking us over. And we're running around. And, Lord, we don't have time for anything important because we've made everything else important. But the truly important thing, the one thing needful, has been left undone. And we ask for thy forgiveness, Lord. We have not sat at thy feet. We have rather been engaged with busyness. Busyness that has cost us so much. It has cost us influence with our children. It has cost us a godly example to our spouses, to our families. It has cost us more than it has paid us. And here we are living in spiritual bankruptcy, asking for thy forgiveness, O Lord. Asking, O Lord, that thou cleanse us from this unrighteousness and defilement. And not only cleanse us so that we can do it again and ask for thy cleansing, but, O oh, Father, that we will definitely make a change that thou wilt lead us, O Lord, to change, to do things differently, to give time to thy work, multitudes, multitudes perishing for want of salvation. And here we are, we think we have it, and we're telling no one. But rather, we are swimming in the stream of the world, and people are watching us, and they're saying, what's the difference, O oh God? Forgive us and cleanse us of this unrighteousness before Thee. And help us, O Lord, not to be in a rush to go hither and yon, but to wait, to wait upon our knees more often so that we can receive Thee, O Lord. We can see ourselves for what we truly are, and we can see Thee for what Thou truly art. And we can come to Thee, O God, and cling to Thy righteousness, especially in these last days, these days of tribulation, these days when it's going to get worse. But even now, Lord, we're not ready. Help us to get ready. Help us to see the second coming as something joyful, which we earnestly anticipate and we wait for it so that whatever tribulation or trial we pass through, we will pass through it with joy and with endurance and with patience. We will remain faithful even in the midst of darkness, even in the midst of persecution, even in the midst of pain. And, oh God, we will be instant in prayer. Prayer will be the instant response of our lives. Not complaining, not murmuring, not gossiping, 
not hatred, not any other thing, but prayer will be instant and we will be instant in it. And we will persevere in it and wait upon thee, O Lord, so that thou canst change us and make us new creations. We thank thee and we praise thee for what thou art about to do in our lives. And we ask all these things now in the precious and holy and gracious name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Amen.